Poe Dameron Volume 2 The Gathering Storm is the second of five trades that collects the complete Poe Dameron comics. As with all the trades, it was written by Charles Soule, and like the last volume, the art was done by Phil Noto. Unlike Volume 1, Volume 2 contains a single arc, The Gathering Storm, which is seven issues long, but only six of them are in this volume. The Gathering Storm contains issues 8 to 13 of the Poe Dameron comic, and ironically, issue 7 kicks off the next volume. I liked the overall plot, and throughout the book there were good things and bad things about the book. I liked how Poe's story runs parallel to that of Terex's present situation and revelations of his past, and the way the book opens immediately following the ending of the last volume, with Poe quietly investigating his team looking for the spy discovered in Volume 1 that's been feeding Black Squadron's information to Terex. 3PO tells Poe they have a mission together to find a droid spy, one of many spies under 3PO's control feeding him First Order information. When I read that, I realised the spy in Black Squadron could have been a droid because nobody ever notices droids because they're so common, but it seemed to go over Poe's head which was a bit unbelievable since he's talking to 3PO and there were droids rolling around everywhere, so it should have clicked for Poe in my opinion. Poe's brash, but he's not stupid, and I think that was a total misstep in the writing. Later on in the comic it's revealed that the spy wasn't a droid, but at the time Poe didn't know that, so I do think he should have said something like, 3PO, if you use droids as spies because nobody notices them, how can we be sure that every droid on Dakar is under our control and there isn't a single droid with First Order programming? The idea of droids spying reminded me of Delta Source from the Thrawn trilogy because in those books there was a single plant that was an electro-biological plant rather than a regular plant and it had been placed right in the main corridor on Coruscant where people discussed every kind of important matter openly. The tree would absorb the sound into ripples and a hidden piece of tech would decode those ripples back to sound and transmit it back to the Imperial Remnant. The technology isn't the same, but the idea of having a spy hide out in the open is, and I think that's why it reminded me of it. Poe, 3PO and Poe's mechanic, Oddy, head to the planet Kadak to rescue the droid spy, and there was a pretty funny moment where Poe, Oddy and 3PO arrive on the planet and someone gets thrown off a giant centralised spire, and Poe has to explain to Oddy that that's how people solve their problems on Kadak. <laughs> it was really funny. There was a pretty cool moment when Poe told 3PO to stop putting himself down by calling other people master and that he should recognise his importance in galactic events. It's the same thing I said about the Resistance in my review of the first volume and that's that the Rebels and the Resistance respect everyone whereas the Empire and the First Order don't. It was also nice to see him treat droids other than BB-8 like that because we know they have their thing and we know Luke had his thing with R2 but Luke was always polite to 3PO2 even though he was his master and technically he didn't need to be. It's a case of look how a person treats those below him to see what they're really like so I liked that this was included. Soul added a really cool aspect to 3PO that I'd never really considered before and that's the fact that because he's a droid he can look at and listen to more than one thing at once and focusing on more than one person at once can be an important skill in diplomacy, one of 3PO's main functions. So I thought it was pretty funny when 3PO ineptly mentions to Poe how he wishes Han were there because he would be at home in a seedy place like the one they were in and explains to Poe that because he's estranged from Leia he had to go back to his old life of smuggling and ended up borrowing money from both Kanja Club and the Guavian Death Gang but 3PO didn't notice that both of them were a few tables over and heard him. It was a fantastic bit of writing because it could have been omitted and no one would have noticed, but you see the gangs walk over to each other and start talking and you know it's a setup for The Force Awakens because it quickly explains how they found out about Han's double dealings and why they started to hunt him down. I do love when Soul does stuff like this, trying to tie things into other things, it's excellent world building and we need more of it in Star Wars.
I didn't like the fact that when Poe, Oddie and 3PO track down the droid they're looking for, 3PO asks the salesman about the droid, the guy asks Poe if he's Poe Dameron, and Poe just straight up says yes, then gets stunned. I'm kind of surprised that Soul wrote it that way because this was supposed to be a high risk, quiet operation, and I can't see why Poe, who supposedly a spy, would just walk around telling everyone who asks who he is. It's like the guy has no sense of being inconspicuous. Of course, I can't blame Poe for that, he's not real, so I have to wonder why Soul wrote such a poor scene. It was equal parts funny and daring when James Bond did it in Casino Royale, and it worked perfectly there because he was also young and brash. But in the case of James Bond, it was his first mission with a 00 license, whereas we know Poe has been doing this for a while. And as I said, he isn't stupid, so it just felt really out of character to me. I would have preferred a situation where Terex had spies and they ambushed Poe because he knew someone from the Resistance would be coming for the droid. That would have made a lot more sense than Poe just outing himself like that and being rendered unconscious because of it. While all that was happening, we were also following Agent Terex's storyline and it was pretty interesting to see so much of his past revealed in this volume. We find out about his time in the Empire, specifically how he dealt with the Battle of Jakku and what it meant for stormtroopers after the Empire lost, and we find out how he came to be in possession of the Carrion Spike. When we see Terex fight on Jakku, we find out his Stormtrooper ID was TK-603, so I wonder if he was on the Death Star before it blew up, because the Stormtrooper who was guarding the captured Falcon in A New Hope was numbered TK-421, and for a station that size, it definitely had more than 600 personnel, so it's entirely possible that Terex was on the first Death Star. Terex escapes Jakku and being captured by the rebels with his comrade Korlak by building a working ship out of an 80-80s head and a tie interceptor's wings and yes, it does look as ridiculous as it sounds, not to mention the fact that we know 80-80s have massive holes all over the place which means it wouldn't be spaceworthy. I suppose he could have patched up all the holes, but it just didn't fly with me because they also would have needed a breathing system, and AT-ATs don't have those, and Stormtroopers don't carry them around with them. So just like the Chewie comic, it's a case of ignoring the lore that came before, and I'm not talking about legends. In the very first movie, you see Rebel pilots with no breathing apparatus, and TIE pilots who need oxygen masks. That's official, it's canon, and has been ignored at least twice now in the Disney canon. Before they left Jakku, Terex and Korlak hid their armour to escape rebel capture for being stormtroopers, but Terex went back for his and rebuilt and customised it with patterns like the clone troopers did, as well as adding a very samurai looking backplate to his helmet, and I wasn't a fan of that design choice, it just seemed out of place and reminded me of Freed and Nad and I've never been a fan of his design. Sometime later, Terex and Korlak made a plan to go back to an Imperial shipyard where Terex used to work, along with two pirates, Wenda and Bet, to rebuild the ships, hide them, recruit surviving members of the Empire and watch it rise up again. When they get to the shipyards, you can see when they get to the shipyard, you can also see the Carrion Spike, just the bottom of it, but you can see it's the same ship. So as you read it, you realise things are starting to fall into place as to how Terex gets his hands on it, which I liked. Unfortunately, Korlak, Wenda and Bet had no intention of rebuilding the Empire, rather they were preparing to build a fleet of pirate ships so they could get rich quick, and since Terex was the only one unaware of this plan, they decided that if Terex gave them trouble about it once he realised the plan, then they'd just kill him. The problem was, Terex was in the Carrion Spike and overheard them plotting using its advanced surveillance systems, so he used the ship's weapons on them and this left Terex as the only survivor and fully in control of the Carrion Spike, so that's perfectly in line with what we know about Terex in the present. 
Terex had an epiphany where he realised the Empire was gone and wasn't coming back, and he set out on a crusade to gain as much control as he could, and there's a small montage where you can see him fighting with what looks to be Gracchus, killing what I think is a bounty hunter, and using the carrion spike to build up a fleet of pirate ships, eventually winning control of Kadak and building a base there. I thought it was ironic for two reasons, the first is that he did it using the carrion spike because that was Tarkin's ship and he stopped the pirate Karna and her crew in his own system using the carrion spike and now Terex is using the ship to do things that Tarkin would have hated. I think Sol has done well and he's clearly read Tarkin and is doing what he does best, tying everything together in a web of lore. The second reason it's ironic is because this was the plan that Korlak, Wenda and Bet had all along, and had Terex had his epiphany a few moments before, they would have been alive and they could have done it all so much quicker because there would have been more of them, but it works story-wise because Terex very much strikes me as a lone wolf. The final piece of Terex's past revealed in this volume is that when he's running the gang, one of the pirates brought him a new Stormtrooper helmet with an updated design. It's more effective and sleeker, and Terex realised it's a First Order helmet and that the First Order was real. This must be where he then goes off in search of what is essentially the empire he'd always dreamed of rebuilding ever since the Battle of Jakku, so his story has gone full circle and we know how he ended up working for Phasma, I like when everything fits together like that. This pretty much leads up to the present, where Terex returns back to Kadak to take back control of the ranks, the gang of pirates he'd built on Kadak, but he'd been away so long that Whisper, one of the people who had been at the shipyard when Terex fired on the others, but survived, had taken control of the ranks in his absence and doesn't want to hand control back to him, so he promptly convinces the ranks to kill her and accept his command, which they do. This is about the same time Poe wakes up after being stunned. It's good timing because the good guys had just found the spy 3PO had been looking for, a BX series droid commando called N1ZX, nicknamed Nunzix, a droid that was programmed with self-preservation as its highest command, so rather than giving Poe or 3PO the information, it demands to be taken back to the Resistance base where it will then reveal its information. It does make you wonder as a reader, because we know the droid had been in Terex's possession, so you can't tell if the droid is a spy for the Resistance, or if it had been corrupted and turned into a double spy for the First Order, and just wanted the location of the hidden Resistance base. Terex then announces to the people over the intercom that he wants Poe Dameron, and the entire population turns on Poe and his crew, so they fight to get back to their ship, and when they arrive, 3PO points out that Oddy has been missing since Terex's announcement, and I was actually surprised by that. I mean, on the one hand, since out of all of Black Squadron, he was the only one that went with Poe, and the fact that Poe is looking for one traitorous spy, I felt like it was a bit obvious that it was Oddy. But the way events played out after Terex's announcement, I didn't pick up on the fact that he disappeared, so that was well written and well drawn. Terex opens a secret hangar which contains loads of old ships, which is basically a fleet of those shitty hybrid ships like the one he built on Jakku, and it's even worse now because there's more of them. I just don't understand why, if they're pirates, they couldn't just take other people's ships rather than build in their own. It makes no sense, and it's part of the story I wish had been left out altogether. It's clear that Terex allowed Poe to get to his ship so he could follow him to the Hidden Resistance base, just like Tarkin did in A New Hope, which was a nice little nod. Terex returns to the Carrion Spike with some of the ranks and reactivates the ship when he's challenged by one of the, presumably, First Order officers as to what his intentions are, and it's basically that he feels undervalued by the First Order, so he's going to deliver the entire Resistance to them, and this fits with his character because he wants order back, he wants the Empire back, and this is the closest thing he will ever get to it. On board, Terex has an interesting conversation with Phasma where he explains his plan to her, but doesn't accept her authority when she tells him open hostilities between the First Order and the Resistance are forbidden. Terex replies by saying he met Darth Vader once, saying that he was a real powerful Darksider, unlike that freak Kylo Ren. 
Terex has issues with Phasma and the First Order in general, but I like that Sol wrote him so that no matter what idiots were in charge, Terex was still loyal to what he considers to be the Empire. During Poe's jump back to Dakar, he realises Odi is the spy and he also realises that the droid is sending out a tracking signal to Terex, so he pulls out of hyperspace and moments later Terex's fleet does the same. There's a pretty quick dogfight and it was extremely funny to see 3PO tied to the outside of a ship while enemy shots are landing only feet away and one of them gets a lucky hit, takes out the engine and Poe has to crash land on a planet. He's incredibly lucky there's a planet there because don't forget he dropped out of hyperspace early and had no idea there was a planet there when he did, so that's a case of deus ex to the rescue. Following Oddy, it's revealed that while he is the spy, it's not because he wants to betray the resistance, it's because he's trying to rescue his wife who Terex had taken on as a slave, along with some other aliens. It raises the question of whether it's okay to do what he did if it helps protect someone he loves, but I don't know why he didn't just go to Poe about it in the first place rather than betray his entire team and all of the resistance, so hopefully that's explained in another volume, because as it stands I don't think there's enough explanation there for what drove the character to make that choice. Poe hides in a cave on the planet and Terex and his crew go after them and there's a pretty cool scene where BB-8 is hanging off the ceiling and he uses his lighter to cut off a stalactite so it drops on some of Terex's men and it was nice to see his lighter used for something other than just the thumbs up moment which I absolutely adored in The Force Awakens. As Poe tries to escape, 3PO tries to give him a head start by deliberately staying behind to slow Terex down, and when he speaks to Terex, he didn't get a chance to give his famous introduction line, instead Terex said it to 3PO which I thought was pretty funny. It reminded me of when Martha Jones first entered the TARDIS and even though she says the famous it's bigger on the inside line, the focus was on David Tennant because he mouthed the words as she said them and it was really funny. I think Sol made excellent use of 3PO because we always hear about his millions of forms of communication, but apart from the odd alien language, we never see it used in a unique way, but Sol has thought outside the box in this case and 3PO uses one of his languages to disturb a race of bat aliens to try and distract Terex's men. It's an excellent use of something that's been underused for 40 years now and Sol should be commended for thinking outside the box. Unfortunately for 3PO, Terex bests him almost immediately and steals 3PO's memory unit, knowing that he's the spymaster for the resistance and all the information the memory unit must have on it. With 3PO down, BB-8 fallen down a hole in the caves, Poe is on his own until Black Squadron arrives just in time and fortunately Temin Wexley is with them and he beams some code to Poe and tells him to insert it into Nunzix and Sol takes this opportunity to bring back the one and only good thing about the Aftermath trilogy, Mr Bones. He may have died in Empire's End, but Temin kept a copy of his code and always carries it with him, and the resurrected Mr. Bones wreaks absolute hell on Terex and his men until Terex decapitates him, Poe manages to disarm Terex, and BB-8 shows up again and electrocutes Terex, meaning the good guys win. In space, Lulo or Lulo? It's not clear how Star Wars uses apostrophes, so I'm just going to call him Lulo for now. Lulo, the pilot of the only A-Wing in Black Squadron, dies in an explosion after being shot down by Terex's fighters, and the First Order arrives and destroys the remnants of Terex's fleet, leaving the Resistance fighters alone. Poe drags Terex out of the cave where the First Order officer is waiting for him. They both choose not to fight, instead honouring their orders about no conflict and Poe hands Terex over to the First Order officer and while all that was happening, Oddy, who had snuck aboard the carrion spike back on Kadak, manages to free someone who was revealed to be his wife and he also rescued all the other slaves on the ship and then they all escape on a pod. It's not clear in volume 2 whether they survived or not, so I'll have to wait till the third volume to find out. So the book ends on a few cliffhangers. What will happen to Terex? Did Oddie and his wife survive? And of course the funeral of Lulo. 
The Resistance wins, but it feels like a hollow win, much like the end of Empire Strikes Back, although the end of that movie was much better, tenser, and had a lot more of an overall impact. Throughout the book, I thought Soul was very good at writing Poe's lines, and I can always imagine Oscar Isaac delivering the lines from the comic, but I just don't hear Anthony Daniels when I read 3PO's lines. I'm not sure why, but I just can't hear 3PO, and Lord knows I wanted to, considering how important he was to the book. The art was done by Phil Noto, and it's just like the last volume, pretty basic, but reliable, and you always know who the characters are supposed to be. He doesn't have a lot of detail, and everything is quite sparse, but it does the job. To be honest, I'm kind of pleased Angel Nzueta takes over for the rest of the Poe Dameron run, because while Noto's art is reliable, it's lacking in something. There's no depth to his work that makes me look forward to reading it. It's always acceptable, but never particularly exciting, so I'm looking forward to seeing a different artist's work in the Poe Dameron comics. The back of the book has the usual stuff, a few pages of variant cover art, and as many pages of ads and nothing else. So overall, I did like Volume 2, but I would have preferred some of that banter from the first volume in it. I understand that it would have been hard to fit in, especially with the tone of the book as it was, but it was one of my favourite things about the first volume, and since there wasn't a massive amount of humour in this volume, I think it would have fitted in just fine. I also thought it was interesting to see so much of Terex's past, because he's a really interesting character, and I hope in future volumes we get to see more about his earlier work with the First Order, or maybe even perhaps see him on the Death Star, as well as seeing whether he can get back in Phasma's good graces or escape the First Order altogether. I think Volume 2 was severely lacking in explanation of what drove the characters to do the things they did, there's no explanation for why Tarek's built an entirely new ship out of an ATAT on Jakku, rather than repairing an actual ship. There's no explanation for why he continued to use ships like that later on instead of stealing ships. There's no explanation for why Poe essentially outed himself on a Black Ops style mission. And there's no explanation for Oddie's choice to betray his team. All those things combined made the book feel lacking, and made it feel like it was an excuse to get characters from point A to point B, without really considering what drives the characters to get there. It's like someone said, hey, how about a ship made out of a flying ATAT? And someone else went, yeah, that's cool, let's do that, without considering the reason why there would be a flying ATAT. Volume 2 does an excellent job continuing the story set up in Volume 1, as well as leading into Volume 3, which I'm very much looking forward to reading, but I really hope Volume 3 is more grounded and takes the time to explain why things were the way they were in Volume 2, because as much fun as Volume 2 was, when the story makes no sense because characters make choices with no explanation of why, it can come across as stupid, and a lot of Volume 2 does exactly that. It's still better than Resistance though. 